Good evening. Tonight, we go after the story of a young actor who seems destined to become Hollywood's biggest star. He's Tony Perkins, and he has a $15 million price tag. That's what Paramount Pictures has invested to make him our next Clark Gable or Gary Cooper. If you're curious to know what this does to a young man who was almost unknown only three years ago, and what Tony Perkins thinks of stardom, of Hollywood's values, and of some news stories which picture him as a brooding misfit, we'll go after those stories in just a moment. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Parliament. The new high filtration filter, Parliament, presents... Wallace interview. We'll talk with Tony Perkins in just a moment. Unless the filter on your cigarette is recessed, it's only doing part of the job. That's why we say now Parliament with the recessed filter is best. That's this cigarette, the new Hi Fi Parliament. The proof? Suppose I show you. First, Parliament is best because only Parliament can give you over 30,000 traps. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. Second, unlike ordinary filters, Parliament's filter is recessed, set deep down inside here, so that trap nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. And third, because it's recessed, there's no bitter taste of trapped nicotine and tar to spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. Remember, Parliament is continuously tested by the independent laboratories of the United States Testing Company. Over 30,000 traps, exclusive recess filter, flavor pure protection. Yes, smoke the best. High five Parliament, now at popular price. And now to our story. Tony Perkins is 25 years old and perhaps the hottest property in motion pictures. His image on the screen seems to intrigue the American public. But his private life, too, has struck a responsive chord with scores of articles appearing to tell eager readers about the real Tony Perkins, the shy Tony Perkins, the searching Tony Perkins. Like some other young men, James Dean, Marlon Brando, Elvis Presley, Tony Perkins would appear in his own way to have a social significance over and above his impact as a film star. Let's try to find out why. First of all, Tony, let me ask you this. Out in Hollywood, it seems to be generally agreed that you are the heir apparent to the throne held in recent years by such stars as Gary Cooper, Clark Gable, Jimmy Stewart. In other words, in a few years, you may very well be the biggest motion picture star in the world. How does that make you feel? Well, that question is quite staggering in itself, uh, discounting the, the fact or the theory. Um, I've never been asked it before, and I don't have a proper answer for it. Uh, I can say that I've never thought in those terms for well, myself. I think it's uh, a little far-seeing, and I, I think it's a little... Um, well, I, I don't have quite that high opinion of myself, I well, guess. Well, I, 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 am, I imagine that it's understandable that you wouldn't, but now that I have put it to you in this, in this fashion, uh, would you worry about it? Let me, let me quote a couple of people. Newsweek, in the cover story they did on you just a few weeks ago, said that you're classed with veterans like Gable, Cooper, Spencer Tracy, Cary Grant... Uh, Mike Connolly in the New York Mirror a year ago said the fastest rising star in the Hollywood heavens is a oh. tall, lanky, not too handsome young actor named Anthony Perkins. Well, that's something else again. A, a, a fast rising star, that, that can, that's a very ambiguous phrase which can have any climax, any ending. Um, well, let me ask you this. Would you like to be the biggest motion picture star in the world? I don't know that I would. Uh, I think that might... Uh, thrust upon me responsibilities which I, I wouldn't be capable of, of solving. What and kind of responsibilities, Tom? Well, if you're the number one star, you can't go anywhere except to be the number two star. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, 
it gives you a uh, a kind of point of no return in your in your career where you you could ne possibly never never achieve anything more you mm. follow me yes uh, I think I think generally to to think or to plan your life or your career in terms like that in terms of being the number one or in terms of being someone like uh, Stewart or Gable or uh, uh, someone of that quality. I think it's dangerous. All right, let's let's approach it from a different point of view. Two or three years ago, you were comparatively unknown, and I imagine that you've thought about this. What is the quality within you that makes you the valuable property to Hollywood that you that you are? What is it? What quality inside Tony Perkins is it that has made you what you are? Well, I think, as Newsweek magazine put it a couple of weeks ago. That quality is probably the one in which the, the quality which I portrayed in the character in Friendly Persuasion, which was my first big picture and the one that opened up a lot of doors for me professionally. Uh, a rather confused, searching, intelligent, but but. Um, seeking sort of youth mm -hmm. who uh, is endeavoring continuously to become better, to improve his surroundings, his his uh, mind, his life. Somebody... A, a Thomas Wolfe like character. Uh -huh. Somebody that a lot of people can identify with. Oh, surely. Well, almost everyone. Yeah. Of course, speaking about this recently with our reporter, you jokingly mentioned that the late movie mogul Harry Cohn who developed Kim Novak, among others, once said, you want to bring me your wife or your aunt? We'll do the same for them. <laughs> now, could it be, Tony, that that's what's happening to you? Hollywood needs a new star, so it selects a good, a good young actor like yourself, starts beating the drums uh, in an effort to convince the public that here is somebody they must see. Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about that question. Uh, I think probably not. Uh... I had made Friendly Persuasion, and the picture was completed, and the character was to be seen by the people at Paramount Studios before they hired me to do more pictures for them. Uh, I think it probably gave them the idea. I don't think they just started one day and said, well, let's make a star and pick me out of a, a photograph. You'd hate to feel that way. Yes, I would. <laughs> And you don't think that's so? No, I don't, because I know they saw some film of me before they ever signed me to my contract. Well, tell me this. We have spoken with Hollywood people before, for instance, the veteran screenwriter Ben Hecht. He told us, frankly, that Hollywood crushes honest creativity, that pictures aren't made by and large for quality, but rather for just plain box office, mostly by businessmen who use actors and writers, too, as pawns. Do you never fear that you... Tony Perkins have been caught up in that kind of thing? Did he say that recently or some time ago? He said that uh, about a month or six weeks ago on this program. Well, these days, with picture making and picture grosses and investing being the way it is, uh, you have to take, or Hollywood must take, a slightly more hard-headed attitude towards the making of pictures and the building of stars than they might have 10 or 15 years ago when almost any picture any quality picture sold. Today, not every quality picture will sell. Uh, if you, you can make a, a wonderful picture with, with wonderful stars and a wonderful story and spend a great deal of money in promotion on it and it still may do nothing at the box office. Uh, I'm sure that colored his statement and I'm sure it's a true one. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some of the prices that you perhaps have to pay, maybe are already beginning to pay for stardom. Publicity, for instance. A recent cover story about you in News, Newsweek magazine that we mentioned, it was on March 3rd, makes you out to be a neurotic, somewhat mean, vaguely unpleasant character. Tony, how do you feel when you read something like that piece? Well, of course, I'm very grateful to Newsweek for putting me on its cover. Start with that. Uh, I guess nothing is perfect, no experience or... Uh, uh, end result of anything is perfect. Of course, I was pretty disturbed at some of the untrue stories in the piece. Uh, I guess one thing may balance another. 
thinking it over, though, for the first time, I've never thought this before, but if I could have read the story and seen the cover, and they would have said, uh, well, would you rather not have us print it and have the story the way it is, I think I would rather they didn't print it. You say for the first time. In other words, up to now, you have I've, liked I've publicity? Never, no, I mean, up to now, in this specific instance, I've never thought of this before. Uh, I don't think it's worth it to me to have my cover, my picture on the cover of Newsweek and have uh, the kind of write-up inside that it was given. Uh -huh. Well, let's take some of the things written in that Newsweek article, and I dwell on this because I know that you want to talk about it. It was one of the conditions which we put when we asked you to come on this program. For instance, it says that one day at a posh press luncheon, you set about eating spaghetti with your hands. True or false? That? No, that's, that's false. Where do they get a story like that? I don't know. Uh, most of the Hollywood stories in the piece come from Newsweek's Hollywood research, I presume, and a great deal of it, almost all of it as far as I can see, was simply reprinted from other stories, um, columnist uh -huh. uh, quotes, and uh, even fan magazines. They said that on location for a picture, you were eating at a table, and when a technical man, a grip, sat down at the table, you snarled, Scram, this is the star's table. Well, that picture was uh, made two years ago, and uh, that story came out about at the time that uh, we were on location with the picture. Uh, it never happened. Not even a variation of that story ever could conceivably happen. Story you why. Why? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm much too... I'm much, I worry too much, a great deal too much about what people uh, think of me and their, their opinions of me to ever to ever uh, commit an action like that, even two years later, with my own personality the way it is, I know I'm just not capable of such a thing. You mean you worry about people, their reaction to Tony Perkins? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Especially with, you know, with the press sometimes misrepresenting you. Story that you once dumped a bucket of water over the head of actress Shirley MacLaine. Oh, I wish she was here. <laughs> Why do you wish you were here? Well, I could ask her. <clears throat> not so. Not so. Where, they, they probably got the story from Shirley MacLaine. They may have. <laughs> the Newsweek article quotes various unnamed Hollywood people sounding off about you. Uh, an example, he's nuts. Another example, I think he ought to meet a good psychiatrist. Well, fine. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't criticize anybody, their own opinion of me. Uh, if anyone thinks I'm nuts or should see a psychiatrist, I'm certainly not going to take exception to a statement like that. It's it's factual story, stories uh, like, uh, you know, pouring water on somebody's head or eating spaghetti with your hands. That's the kind of thing which uh, which kind of hurts and uh, which you, you take exception to. Of course, not all of the articles about you are like this. There are, the, uh, the great majority of them have uh, been very complimentary, but there are a few similar to this Newsweek story. Now, what I'd like to... No, is your evaluation of why? Why do you think people want to write this kind of story if the material in it is, let's say, uh, somewhat less than completely accurate? Well, I, I don't think I don't think the magazines or the stories strive to tell stories that are not completely accurate. But I think probably it sells more magazines if you can present a more colorful or. Uh, a uh, controversial picture of a, a celebrity or an actor or a personality. I think it uh, it's, it um, stimulates reading. I, I think people enjoy reading that kind of story or mixed kinds of stories uh -huh. rather than they would a, a, a completely um, pleasant piece. Let me ask you this. Do you think that there is any resentment among people in the communications industry uh, or possibly a resentment among people in Hollywood itself that a young fellow like you, 25, made it so quick, so big, and that therefore they might want to detract a little bit? Um, I used to hate to think so. Uh, then it seemed to me human nature, if some people did think so, now I'm more or less accepted as, as the truth. Uh, if I'm sure some people do. Why shouldn't they? Uh, uh, I might myself in the same position. You what? I might feel that way myself if, if uh -huh. I found myself stranded in my career or or nowhere in my career and uh, saw other people zooming ahead of me, uh, I think I might feel pretty badly about it. We talked recently with a young actress by the name of Jean Seberg from Bonjour Tristesse. She told us that ever since her career began, she's had to regard the people 
around her, even acquaintances, with a certain degree of suspicion. She said, once you're famous, people try to use you. Have you found that to be true, too? Yes, uh, I have. Not, uh, not a tremendous percent of people, of course, try to use you. Uh, I think it's, it's bad to be suspicious of people and be not trusting of people. But uh, I have been burned in this kind of uh, thing once or twice, and it makes you, uh, you know, a little touchy, a little wary on, on the subject. Yes, once or twice is plenty, you know, to... Do you have many friends, Tony? Not a, not a tremendous amount. The ones I do have, I know I can count on. I understand that you still live in the same 50 or $55 a month flat here in Manhattan that you lived in before you hit the jackpot. Is that true? Yes, I do. Why? Well, it's, it's home to me. <laughs> but you've had no desire to change your mode of living? No, I, I lived there for about five years bef before that. That makes about six years or seven years now. I, I, I wouldn't move uh, for any, you know, I wouldn't move to go to a more fancy place or a more elaborate place. Uh, it's a very nice apartment, you should see it. It has nothing to do with uh, a feeling of insecurity that maybe this just won't last. It's like they used to say, don't send out your laundry because the act may not finish the week. No, uh, I, I have felt that way, and uh, it may uh, color my actions in, in other departments, uh, not as far as my where I live goes, no. I've read that sometimes you wake up at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning and you drive your car around New York City alone, looking up at the buildings and the streets. Well, I do. Don't you? I haven't, no. <laughs> why, why do you do it? Well, um... On Sunday mornings, if you if you drive slowly around and you see uh, something you want to look at, you can stop your car right in the middle of the street if you want to. There's no one around to tell you not to or move on. And I don't know. I take the top down, I take it off. It's a you know removable top, and I don't know. It seems like a perfectly legitimate and unexcentric thing to do. Uh, is the life of being a star, Tony, for a young man? Is it an increasingly lonely life? Well, it can be. Um, Hollywood is apt to be a rather lonely place. Uh, I, I don't know why. The, the, the people and actors and actresses and people you know professionally in New York uh, and know and see occasionally uh, once these same people get to Hollywood, and you're there too, uh, there's a, a lack of connection, even with the people you, you knew in another place. It, why? Uh, I don't know why. It just doesn't happen in Hollywood. People are uh, are different. It's a, it's a it's something I'm convinced of. Hollywood does something small, and by small I mean slight, uh, to a character or a, or a uh, personality. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel in any sense isolated from people? Uh, do you feel, does the responsibility of being a star and of having all of this money on your shoulders, does that, does that weigh upon you? Does it give you a sense of isolation that you... No, you mean, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, I think it's very dangerous for an actor to, to isolate himself uh, totally or even partially from, from human contact. It's well, important. Let me ask you this then. Marlon Brando once said that most of the successful people in Hollywood are failures as human beings. Do you agree? Most of the successful people in Hollywood are failures as human beings? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know very many successful people in Hollywood. Uh, I hope that isn't so, since I'm becoming more successful. Well, could it be that, that, that the public love that you get, the public, not the private yes. love that you get, the glamour, the fame, becomes so important that the star will neglect personal relationships and the development of themselves, himself, as a human being? Well, it shouldn't. Uh, there's, no, there's no question that the, for instance, in the theater, the, the applause and the, the love that you get... Uh, from the audience every night is a is a quite a filling one and quite a, a satis satisfactory one. Sufficiently satisfactory to make up for the lo the lack of the other. Well, no, that's the point. Uh, it mustn't become too satisfactory. It mustn't 
take the place entirely or even um, it mustn't take a large percent of that love the uh, the need that need it uh, it's you know it's it's dangerous to the personality and it's dangerous to the to the soul if that happens Tony in, a moment, in, in movies it's a totally different thing since you really do most of your work most of your acting uh, uh -huh. uh, by yourself and with only the camera to to applaud you and from what you say your social life can be kind of lonely and isolated in Hollywood too. yes it can in a moment, Tony, I'd like to ask you about something else. In the past few years, we've come to hear your generation described as the beat generation. It's supposed to be a generation without roots, drifting, no real social convictions, finding release in jazz, sometimes even immorality, drugs. You were told our reporter this week, you said, I respond to the beat generation. I admire and pity it. In a moment, I'd like to know why and we'll get Tony Perkins' answer in just 60 seconds. Now, Parliament with recessed filter is best. Best is the word for this new hi-fi Parliament. Over 30,000 traps. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. And because this filter is recessed, trap nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. Let me demonstrate with this chalk. Just take any other filter cigarette. Chalk the filter, like this. Then Parliament's recessed filter set deep down inside here. Now, press both against glass. See? The ordinary filter leaves the smear. That's the point. Only in Parliament, the bitter nicotine and tar from the filter cannot get on your lips. Can't spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. You get a clean, satisfying smoke. All filter findings confirmed by the United States Testing Company. Smoke the best. High Filtration Parliament, now popular price. That's the Parliament story. Parliament with the recessed filter, best. Try Parliament yourself. Now then, Tony, you told our reporter, you said, I respond to the beat generation. I admire and pity it. Why? Well, uh, I meant that more or less in connection with the book on the road, which is or, or was supposed to be the the uh, Bible or the main the main expression l literary expression of the B generation is that true is it still the Kerouac book yes. I think so yes that's the testament uh, the characters in that book I do both pity and admire uh, their irresponsibility their lack of their lack of inhibition no their <laughs> well. their no their their inhibition their uh, their total freedom with themselves is uh, something which I'm sure everyone at, at one time or at, at one time during any day or any week, you know, would like to emulate. Uh, the freedom. Yes, sure. But, of course, their, that, same, that same lack of responsibility and their, that same total uh, uprooting from responsibility in family ties or whatever is also, you know, a, a, can also be a subject of uh, regret and, and pity for me. Well, what do you think makes people of your generation beat? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that they're any more or less beat than any other generation in the past. So I guess that you, you don't could, realize. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> so I guess you could call that a general social question, which I'm, or at least I would consider it a... Uh, general social question, which I wouldn't be qualified to answer. Tony, what do you believe in? What what makes you passionate? What makes you angry? What conviction do you have? What about your religious conviction? Do you have any serious one? Well, I, w I went to school where we were very strongly uh, bent towards the straight Protestant Reformation Church. Uh, I admire it and uh, think it's as good an expression of religious feeling as you can find. Do you go to church? No, I don't go to formal church here, no. I go to in California once in a while. Does freedom, does justice, if I may use these terms in this sense, does that concern you a good deal? Of course it concerns me. It concerns me tremendously. It's uh, I think an, an actor 
must be concerned with things like that to in order to portray a, a personality who who desires freedom and justice for himself as most of the parts I've played have mm -hmm. uh, must have in himself a, a tremendous feeding for it. I do. The kind of freedom, though, that you admire, you say, of the Beat Generation, what kind of freedom oh, well, that's, is that? That's, that's another kind. Yes. That's, that's a, an irresponsible freedom. That's a, uh, a lassitude, almost. That's, a, uh, a, that's irresponsibility. That's the best way I can, I can state it. It's, uh, well, the Beat Generation, do they not feel perhaps the way they do for the reason that they feel maybe the bomb is going to drop, maybe we're going to war. No, no. What's, the, what's the purpose of, of, of life? That, that may be an excuse, but I, I, I don't think that the bomb or, or social um, catastrophes or political what have you, I don't think that's any excuse, or I don't think the B generation should accept that. I don't, they, I don't think they have to make excuses for themselves. I, I... Tony, final question. What does having a good time, besides acting, what does having a good time mean to you? Reading, going to the seashore, uh, swimming far out, and lying on my back, and just drifting. You telling me the truth? Yes. Thank you very much, Tony Perkins, for coming and spending this time, and continued good luck to you in your career. Thanks, Mark. Just as it grinds out films, Hollywood grinds out stars. Sometimes they're glossy, brittle things made to order, think and behave as they're told. Rebellion is resisted in Hollywood. It's often distorted in segments of the press, which is the unfortunate price a public property must pay for individuality. In just a moment, we'll bring you the rundown on next week's guest, a playwright and star who says that the best humor is subversive. Now, though, a word on Parliament. When you compare filter cigarettes, it's easy to see why now Parliament with the recessed filter is best. Let me show you why. First, over 30,000 traps in this filter. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. Second, unlike every other filter, Parliament's filter is recessed set deep down inside here so that trapped nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. And third, because it's recessed, there's no bitter taste of trapped nicotine and tar to spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. Remember, Parliament is continuously tested by the independent laboratories of the United States Testing Company. Smoke the best. Hi-Fi Parliament. Now at popular price. Next week, we'll go after the story of perhaps the brightest new television personality of the season and his reverent and irreverent thoughts on our life and times. You see him here. He's Britain's Peter Ustinov, actor, director, playwright, novelist, inexhaustible raconteur. If you're curious to know why Peter Ustinov says that humor is a serious business, what he thinks of the British monarchy, Brigitte Bardot, money and death, and if you want to hear why Mr. Ustinov, despite his vast talents, was a flop as a student and as a soldier in the British Army, we'll go after those stories next week. Till then, for Parliament, Mike Wallace, good night. The Mike Wallace interview has been brought to you by the new High Filtration Parliament. Parliament, now for the first time at popular price. Sunday is Fun Day with Sid Caesar and his cohorts are in to entertain. Enjoy their comedy tomorrow on ABC Television Network.